الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا من من ضائع إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب شري صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني أفكار قولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network the Peace TV English the Peace TV Urdu the Peace TV Bangla and the Peace TV Chinese as well as the viewers on my four social media platforms which are the Facebook the YouTube the Instagram and Twitter I welcome all the viewers with their Sami greetings Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I welcome all the viewers to this program as Dr. Zakir and his son Farik, season 3, session 3. I would like to thank Farik for handling the first part of the program and now inshallah we proceed to the second part of the program. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed you and you are unable to reply or any question which atheists may have asked you regarding Islam, or any question that you might have found on the media, any misconceptions on the media regarding Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your questions in brief on any of the four social media platforms, but the best would be sending it as a text message on the WhatsApp, mentioning the question in brief, along with your name, your profession, the city and country of origin, to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat, plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. We take the first question. First question is, my name is Aisha from Bangalore, India. Is it permissible to do yoga in Islam? Recently, I read somewhere that it is an act of Hindu worshipping. Is it true? Can you please explain? As far as yoga is concerned, if you go to its history, it originated somewhere close to 5000 years before. It originated in 3000 BC in the pre-Vedic age in the Indus Valley civilization and yoga it is associated with physical mental as well as spiritual activities and it is also mentioned later on in the Hindu scriptures it's mentioned in the Rig Veda Volume number 5, chapter number 81, verse number 1, the word yoga is mentioned in relation to the sun god. It's mentioned in the Upanishads, it's mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, it's mentioned in the Buddhist scriptures, including the Jain scriptures. And you'll find it's mentioned in the 5th and 6th century BC. And it was made more famous to the Western world in the 20th century by Swami Vivekananda. The word yoga means union. It means union with God. It also means union with spirit. There are various different meanings depending upon the context it occurs in, whether in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in Bhagavad Gita. But it is for sure associated with Hinduism and also with Buddhism and Jainism. As far as whether yoga is permissible or not, there is one group of scholars who say that it's a form of exercise and as long as you're concerned only with the exercise and not related with the religious aspect, it is permitted. There is another group of scholars who say that as long as you do not do anything haram which is not against the Sharia, yoga is permitted. But the majority of the scholars, they agree that yoga in any form, it is not permissible, it is haram. And if you analyze that yoga is associated with Hinduism and as I mentioned the meaning of yoga is union with God and there are various different 
forms and asanas of yoga. One of the most famous is the Surya Namaskar, which is the salutation to sun god. So, but naturally, this is nothing but a form of idol worship. It's a form of worshipping a false god. I'm sorry. So many of the asanas and the practices of yoga, it is related with Hinduism and it leads to shirk. So based on this aspect, according to me, I do agree with the last group of scholars and the majority of scholars who say that yoga in any form, if a Muslim does, it is prohibited. It is not permissible for a Muslim to involve in any of the yoga practices. And if you analyze, the main goal of yoga is to attain moksha. It is to attain salvation. So since it is regarding Hinduism involving associating partners with God, which is shirk, it means attaining salvation. So according to me, yoga in any form, it is prohibited. Those Muslims who say it is permitted, they may not be aware of the, of the teachings of Hinduism. They may not be aware of comparative religion. And in ignorance, they may have been giving their view. But according to me, for a Muslim, doing yoga is prohibited. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I am Muhammad Zamul Sarkar Sagar. I am a student. I am from Bangladesh. My question is whether is it permissible to take money for preaching Islam? The question asked is, is it permissible to take money for preaching Islam? As far as taking money for preaching Islam, it is mubah under normal, under normal conditions, it is mubah. It is permitted. Neither it is mustahab, encouraged, neither it is discouraged, it is mubah. As far as taking money for preaching Islam can be divided into two broad categories. One is being an employee of a DAWA organization where you're a full-time paid employee and they're giving you salary. As far as this is concerned, alhamdulillah, working for a DAWA organization as compared to non dawa organization which are halal, it is mustahab. If you are working for a dawa organization, it's mustahab. Only thing you should take care that the salary you are drawing should be what is your market value. If you are taking a salary which is the market value for your ability, for the work that you are providing to that Islamic organization, it is perfectly fine. Either market value or less than that. But if you demand more than the market value, what is the market value, then it is, it is not mustahab. So my reply that though it is permissible, it is preferable to work for a dawa organization as compared to working for any non-Islamic organization which is halal. They may be dealing in biscuits or halal products, but it is not related with Islam, so it is preferable to work for an Islamic DAO organization as long as the salary you're drawing should be what is worth of your time you're giving. As far as my organization was concerned in Bombay, Alhamdulillah, we always had a policy that whenever we employed anyone, any Muslim, into organization, we used to see what was his salary in the previous organization or previous company. And as a policy, Almost all the times, we always gave 20% or 25% more than what he used to draw outside. So that our philosophy was that at least we take care of our Muslim brothers and sisters and inshallah they will give a better output to us. So they get both dunya as well as the akhirah. This was our philosophy. The caution to be taken is that many Muslim dies they start organizations 
and they are the head of the organization, they may be the president or the chairman, and there are few employees, and they decide the salary for the other employees, and they decide salary for themselves also. If you are the Amir of your organization, and you are giving salary to yourself, this is very critical. For you to decide what is your salary, you have to be very careful. If you yourself being an Amir, take much more than what you really deserve, then it is not advisable and it is not mustahab. So always I tell my students and when I give dawah talks that if you are the head of the organization and if you are taking the decision what should be the salary and if you decide salary for yourself, you have to be careful that if you decide for yourself more than what you deserve, then your sawab would be reduced in the akhirah. As far as the other employees are concerned, your boss is giving you salary and uh, Uh, your boss is the one who's deciding and if he gives you more than what you deserve alhamdulillah as long as you're not demanding he's giving you more than what you deserve there's no problem at all as a policy as i told you that we used to give more than what the market value is so that our employees are happy and they're satisfied the second category is that when a dai when he's going for a lecture and someone invites him and he demands money for giving lecture, for preaching Islam. This, a person has to be careful. There are two types of culture, that is one is the Eastern culture and one is the Western culture. Where I come from, India, and I started Dawa in the mid-90s, and if someone offered me money to give lecture, it would be like an insult to me. I am doing for sake of Allah, and how come they are offering me money? It would be like an insult. But in the Western world, because of the Western culture being influenced by the Western philosophy of, you know, everything is weighed in money, unfortunately, even many of the Islamic organizations get carried away by the Western culture and they start demanding money and they start demanding much more than what they deserve. This, you have to be careful. And this Western culture slowly, slowly has spread to almost all the countries of the world. Previously, where it was out of the question that anyone asking for money for giving Islamic lectures in India, Pakistan, but slowly, slowly, yes, someone gave voluntary, no problem. But slowly, slowly, the culture of the West has percolated into the Indian subcontinent, into the east part of the world. And now we find that even here, many of the Dais have started demanding demanding what you're actually worth or an amount which will take care of family on a lower level is no problem but demanding something much more and adding to it that i want this facility i want a business class ticket i want a first class air ticket i want to stay in a five-star hotel and so much requirement is that this is not advisable and it's not encouraged but unfortunately today we find in the western world more than 95 percent according to me of the dais, they demand a money that if the money is not given, they will not come. And that's a very sad story. There are very few dais who may not be demanding money. And this culture has even come to the eastern part of the world. And now we find even in the eastern part of the world, in India, Pakistan, we find the dais, if not all, then more than three, four, at least 75 percent the demand, which is not a good sign. If someone is voluntarily giving you some money for giving a talk and you take it, whatever they give, that's the best, alhamdulillah. If you demand what the minimum required, you say that, okay, you pay for my air ticket, pay for my simple accommodation, no problem. But demanding, I want a five star, I want a business class ticket, this is not mustahab. And it's not to be encouraged. And unfortunately, nowadays, giving lectures, has on giving lectures and asking for money has become a business, which I feel is not encouraged in Islam. Asking what is required or minimum level, no problem. I always say that it is preferable you don't take money, it is mustahab. As far as I'm concerned, alhamdulillah, I've been doing dawah for the last more than 30 years. MashaAllah, Allah's help has been there, Allah's grace has been there, and Allah's mercy has been there, that alhamdulillah, 
out of the thousands of lectures that I've given, you know, few thousand lectures in different parts of the world, never ever have I demanded or taken money for a single lecture. Alhamdulillah, Allah's grace. And whenever someone calls me for a lecture tour, I have my criteria. Number one is that I will pay for my own air ticket to and fro. Number two, I will pay for my whole I will pay for my own hotel accommodation, lodging and boarding. I only say that you have to arrange for my visa. These are my conditions. But naturally, when we go, the organization they already booked the hotel in advance and if they don't allow me to pay, I cannot force them. But as far as the air ticket is concerned, Alhamdulillah, always I make it a point that I pay it from my own pocket. Except if it is an invitation from the head of states or on a government level where it's difficult to argue with them. There are a few cases that these are the only occasions that I don't force them. Otherwise, any even a top businessman calls me, even, even a billionaire calls me. As far as the to and fro air ticket is concerned, Alhamdulillah, I always pay and that is much more expensive than the hotel accommodation. And Alhamdulillah, Allah has given barka. Alhamdulillah, and we see that if you do it for sake of Allah, Allah gives you multiple times more by other means. So this is my request to most of the duas is that have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't demand what the organization give you. You can take it. But the moment you start demanding that our minimum so much I want for a talk. And that's the reason you find that most of the Western organization, when you go for Dawa lectures, they charge which is, I don't think it is preferable or it is advisable to charge for people attending Islamic lectures. I remember the first time I went to Canada, I was shocked that I kept a ticket for my entry, $10 ticket. I said, $10 for what? So after that, I made the policy. When I accept an invitation, I say that you should not charge for the entry of the talk. Unless if it's a conference. And during a conference, because they're calling many speakers and they may not be able to generate funds. So during conferences, if they charge a fee for the entry, I don't object. But as far as the conferences we have done, mashallah, we have done by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the largest Islamic conference in the world. The largest Islamic English conference in the world. Mashallah, more than a million people attending over a span of 10 days in terms of technology, in terms of expenses. It's the largest, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, in these conferences, never ever have we charged a single penny for any of the lectures. And we find that Allah's barqa is there, that when we give it complimentary, Allah helps the organization in a bigger way. And by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we became the largest, mashallah, private organization in the world. You know, having more than 500 full-time paid employees. When in Bombay, mashallah, our organization and the sister concern had 500 full-time paid employees. And mashallah, we had more than 10,000 volunteers in Bombay alone. And in other parts, we had more employees and more volunteers. So I believe that money amongst the 10 important things, it is the least important, number 10. It's important, but in the top 10, it would come the last. Unfortunately, most of the Muslim organizations are so much bothered about the finances, how we're going to recover it. They're more bothered about recovering the money they spend. That's the reason the reach becomes minimal, audience becomes less, there's less barka. So I personally pr prefer that for the Islamic lecture, there should not be any charge. And surely amongst the Muslim Ummah, there are various people who are big hearted, who are willing to give donation. And by that way, you are most welcome to do the lectures. But if someone does keep a minimal fee because they cannot get donations, I've got no objection, but should not be exorbitant. Now it has become a trend that people are giving workshops and they're charging a thousand dollars and two thousand dollars and few thousand dollars and because they're popular they're demanding money which I feel is not with the spirit of Islam and uh, Alhamdulillah a few years back there was an article written by Sheikh Haitham al Haddad and there was a beautiful article on how many of the Muslim dies 
you know, are demanding money and they have made it a business. It's a very good article. So my, uh, my request is that have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, he'll give you multiple times more. If you do for akhirah, Allah will give you akhirah and dunya also. If you do for dunya, you'll get dunya but not akhirah. So in short, taking money for preaching Islam within limits is permissible. But mustab is not taking it all. If Allah has given you that ability, has given you uh, the wealth, it's preferable not to take. But if someone takes, as long as it is within the limits, it is permissible. But see to it that don't exploit the people and the organization. And inshallah, Allah will shower on you more blessings, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Make this more zoom. See the skin cut. The candle is eating cut. Make it more wide. The third candle should come. Where are the comments? Uh, where are the comments on the Facebook? Where are the comments? Put the comments on. The theatre is fine. In the YouTube, it is fine. There. Hmm? Hmm. Uh, we have on the Facebook Muhammad Nilu Khan, Yasin Arafat Araf, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam, Mehdi Hassan, MashaAllah, Akhtar Sadia, Waran Nur Al Din, God protect you, Abdul Ghani. MP MashaAllah, Abdullah Ahmad, I love Dr. Zakir Naik, I love you too for the sake of Allah. Muhammad Saif Altaf, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. Iman Mrida, Sojib Islam, Fatima to Zahra, M. Tokan Ali, Sir, I love you, I love you too for the sake of Allah. Tanzil Azam, Love you, Dr. Zakir Naik. I love you too. Muhammad Sabuj. Ali Benama. Shweb Adil. You have on the YouTube Raymond. Tahmid Mahmood. Yusuf Samsur. Fardin Khan. Khan Hamza, Idan Rocks, Niyas Muhammad, Sar Walid, Tanzil, Tanzim Ahmad, Muhammad Sadim, Rehan Entertainment, Nishad Sain, Muhammad Himil, most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam, they're doing duas for me, and I ask Allah, to bless you too. There's a question asked by Abu Bakr Siddiq on the Facebook. Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum salam. Dr. Zakir, 
I am from Bangladesh, sir is making games haram as a profession. If the games you are making is halal, then the profession of making games is halal. If you make haram games, which are against the teachings of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, then the game is haram. So it depends upon which type of game are you making. If the game you are making is a halal game within the purview of the Islamic Sharia, not breaking any of the teachings of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, then it is permissible. But if you make games which involve obscenity, which involve shirk, etc., then such type of games is not permitted and it is haram. Next question from Bridgesh, India. I am not a Muslim yet. I have seen several videos of Dr. Zakir Naik. I am interested in reading the Quran. I checked the translations of the Quran in English and also checked the translations in Malayalam. I found many translations of the Quran translated by many people. Can you suggest a correct translation of the Quran in English or Malayalam? I heard your speech about the Big Bang being mentioned in the Quran, but how is it possible? Big Bang is millions of years process, then how can Allah create the entire universe in six days? Brother Brijesh, who is not a Muslim yet, has asked a question that which is a good translation of the Quran in English or Malayalam? I don't know Malayalam, so I won't be able to help you in that. But as far as the English translation is concerned, a good translation looking into various aspects, I would suggest the translation of the glorious Quran by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, which is the revised edition. There are various there are various editions available of Abdullah Sifali. I would prefer if you read the revised edition. It's published by the Triple IT in USA and it's available in different parts of the world. The revised edition by Abdullah Sifali. Besides the translation, there's also uh, the commentary as well as footnotes. And there are many explanations given. So that's the reason if a layman reads this translation, it is the most beneficial. The other translation which is good is the Sahih International. It has been translated by three Western women after they accepted Islam. And that's also a good translation, but it is only a basic translation. It doesn't contain many footnotes, doesn't contain explanation. So overall, the best I would recommend is by Abdul Yusuf Ali, the revised edition. And if you want a short and sweet without any explanation, without footnotes, the other good translation is of the Sai International. Regarding a second question that you have heard me talking about the Big Bang being mentioned in the Quran and Big Bang has taken place millions of years ago and it's a big process, long process, but Quran says Allah has created the heaven and the earth in six days, so isn't it contradicting science? What the brother is referring to is the verse of the Quran where Allah says in the Quran, in sorry, Ambiya, Chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah says, Awalam yiral lazina kafuru, anna samawati wal arda, kaanat ratkan fartak nahuma, that the heavens and the earth, do not the unbelievers see, that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. So this verse of the Quran is talking about the Big Bang in a nutshell, the creation of the universe. Today scientists they tell us that our universe initially was a primary nebula, the one mass. Later on, there was a secondary separation, a Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, which gave rise to stars, sun, moon, and the earth we live in. So this, what the scientists they tell us, it was first described approximately 47 to 50 years before, for which a couple of scientists were given the Nobel Prize in 1973. 
for describing the creation of the universe. This, what the scientists have discovered 47 to 50 years back, is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, in a nutshell. That do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. Regarding a question, that the scientists they tell us that the Big Bang is a process which has taken millions of years for the formation of the universe, but the Quran says that Allah has created the heaven and the earth in six days. So isn't it contradicting to science? There are various places in which Allah says in the Quran that Allah has created the heaven and the earth in six days. Allah says in the Quran, Allah has created the heaven and the earth in six days. This is mentioned several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 54. In Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 3. In Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 7. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59. In Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 4. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 38. It's also mentioned in Surah Hadith, chapter number 57, verse number 4. In several places, Allah says, خَلَقَ samawati wal ard fi sitati ayam. That it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has created the heavens and the earth in six days. <coughs> The Arabic word used in the Quran is ayam. It's a plural of the word yom. Yom, one of its meaning is day. But the other meaning of yom is also a period, an epoch. So here when Allah says Allah has created the heavens and the earth in six ayam, it actually refers to six period, six epochs. So scientists today have no problem with the Quranic narration that the heaven and the earth were created in six long periods. Each period can be a million year, a billion year, there's no limit, epoch, long period. As compared to what is mentioned in the Bible, in the Bible when it says that God created the heaven and the earth in six days, it refers to 24 hours day. It says there is morning, it has evening, but here in the Quran, it is not the same as it is mentioned in the Bible. So in the Quran it only says ayam and here ayam is the plural of yom. One of its meaning is day, the other meaning is a period, an epoch. So as far as the Big Bang, as I mentioned, I mentioned Nashal in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 30, as far as the creation of the heaven and the earth in six days, it actually refers to six long periods. It can be billions of years, it can be more, it can be less. Scientists have got no objection in the Quranic narration that the heavens and the earth were created in six long periods. Hope that answers the question. The next question by Ashikur Rahman. Can children play with dolls? As far as children playing with doll, there are several hadith speaking about this. And the very famous hadith, it's a mutafiq alaik, present in Bukhari as well as Muslim. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6130, as well as Sahih Muslim, volume number 6, hadith number 6287, where Hazrat Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, she says that she was playing with her friends with the dolls and the Prophet enters. The moment the friends, her friends, see the Prophet entering, they run away and they hide. So the Prophet says, why don't you continue playing with Aisha? May Allah be pleased with her. By this hadith we come to know that the Prophet did not object when Aisha anha, when she played with her friends when she was young, when she played with her friends. So this hadith and there are various other hadith by which it is evident that the Prophet did not object for children, whether male or female, playing with dolls. So in Islam, it is permitted for a child, whether male or female, or even for the mother while playing 
with the children to use dolls. In this case, it's permitted. Hope that answers the question. And the next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Rahim Nasser from UK. I am a college student. I am a big fan of you and I truly appreciate who you are and what you have done for many practicing Muslims in the world, mashallah. When I was younger, my brother and I were involved in a car collision whereby the other driver was at fault. There was no injury or casualty, alhamdulillah. However, I claimed for whiplash and neck injury for which I was compensated with money. Now I understand that this is haram. By Allah's grace, I have been shown the right path and I started to amend my ways from then. However, I am not sure what to do concerning this money I have falsely claimed. I am in desperate need for some conclusion for my predicament. If you can please help me, Jazakallah, brother. which is left hand, which is up. <coughs> and the brother asked a question that he was involved in an accident many years before and uh, he falsely claimed saying that he had whiplash injury in fact he had no injury and for which he was compensated by money he later on realized that this is not the right thing to do in Islam and he's repenting and he said what should I do what should I do with the money I have brother from the question it appears that Alhamdulillah Allah has guided you the right path and you have agreed that what you have done is wrong that's very important as far as repentance to be accepted is concerned there are five criteria Number one is to agree what you have done is wrong. Agree it is wrong. Number two, you have to stop it. Number three, ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, not to do it again. And number five, undo it if you can. So in this case, Alhamdulillah, we have realized from a question that we have agreed it is wrong. And you are repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have stopped it. Inshallah, you will not do it again. As far as the money that you have with you, my advice to you would be that you should return it back to the people who you claim from. Whether you claim from the driver who was at fault or whether you claim from the insurance company, my advice to you would be that you have realized what you have done is wrong, it's haram, it is cheating. So my request to you is that you contact the person from whom you claim the money or the insurance company from whom you claim the money and return it back to them and apologize and ask for, ask for the forgiveness, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. The next question, Sir, I am Ahmed from Pakistan. If Hindu scriptures are not the word of God, then how are the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned in it? It's a very important question that if the Hindu scriptures are not considered to be the word of God, then how come the prophecies of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned in Hindu scriptures? You have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38. Allah says, Walikullin ajlin kitab. Walikulli ajlin kitab. In every age have we sent a revelation. Have we sent a book? By name, there are only four revelations mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, Dawud peace be upon him. 
Injil is the Wahid, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that is the Quran, is the last and final revelation, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Quran says there were many other revelations. For example, Suhu for Ibrahim, the books of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and many others. But by name, only four are mentioned. So according to me, I consider that there are high chances, high possibility that these Hindu scriptures, these Hindu scriptures, they were at one time words of God. But due to passage of time, people may have changed it. And today what we have is a corrupted form of that original word of God. But you cannot say for sure that it was the word of God. I'm saying high chances. So one of the options is that there are possibility that this may have been the word of God. Today, if you read the Bible, there are so many things mentioned in the Bible which you cannot accept to be the word of God. There is contradiction, there is unscientific thing mentioned in the Bible, there is pornography. So no human being in his normal sense can attribute these things to God. But we know that the Quran says that Injil was a revelation of Wahi which was revealed to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So this Bible what we have today is the corrupted form of the original Injil which was given to Isa alayhi salam. So similarly there were many other revelations by name we don't know them. So can be possible that the Vedas were the word of God, Allah alam. But even if they were the word of God, they were only meant for those people and for that time. All the revelation that came before the glorious Quran was meant only for those people and that time. So even if it was the word of God, it was meant only for those people and that time. So since all the revelation that came before the Quran was meant only for those people and that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not think it fit to preserve it in its original form. But since Quran is not revealed only for the Muslims or the Arabs, Quran is revealed for the whole of humankind. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 52, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 185, in Surah Zumur chapter 39 verse number 41. So Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. So because this Quran is the last and final revelation, which was revealed for the whole of humankind, Allah takes it upon himself that he will protect it and he will guard it. Allah says in Surah Hijar chapter 15 verse number 87, no, the, Verse number 9, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard it from corruption. So one of the possibility regarding the Hindu scriptures is it can be the word of God. The other possibility is that maybe some human being wrote these Hindu scriptures and may have copied some verses from the revelation of God. For example, today if someone writes a book on philosophy, and picks up some verses of the Quran and mixes with his philosophy which is not from God. So the book of course is not from God. But because he's copied verses from the Quran, it may have some verses which are from God. So there are possibility that this may have been written by human beings. Because today the Hindu scholars, they themselves do not know how old are these books, the Vedas. One of the scholars, Dayanan Saraswati, the founder, of Arya Samaj, he says the Vedas are 1310 million years old. But according to the majority of the scholars, the Vedas are about 4000 years old. So because we don't know where was this originally from, in which part of the world was it revealed, or it came initially, who wrote it, there are various things which are not known. That's the reason I feel that I can think of two options. Maybe it was the word of God and it has changed and yet there are remnants of Tawheed in it. There are remnants of the prophecies of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the other option is that it may have been written by a human being and picked up from some spiritual scriptures which was the word of God and added to his book and what we have today is the Hindu scriptures. Hope that answers the question. We have on the Facebook Fatma Abdul Al Razik. Ahmad Kriya, Javed Naik, Faisal Abdullah Farah, Nusrat Jahan Tuktuli, Hani Uruj, Bashar bin Sayyid, Ismail Hussain, Mahathir Muhammad, Kamran Ahmad, 
Tamid Hassan Saad. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah bless all of you. On the YouTube, we have Samin Haq, Sayyid Aryan, Tahmid Mahmood, Mrs. Asif, Muhammad Zaid Bilal, Surya Nahin, Shihab Mustaqim, Tawseef Taha, Nadeem Dehne, Suleiman Atak, Istighfar, Muhammad Sami, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Many are saying they love me. I love you too for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah bless all of you. The next question is, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I am Abdus Salam from Birmingham, UK. Is celebrating birthday parties permissible in Islam? A similar question is asked by Aisha from Chicago, USA. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. If celebrating birthday is not permissible in Islam because of the un-Islamic activities done, then can we call our friends on the birthday and have an Islamic lecture and Islamic activities? A question on a similar topic. My name is Abdul Moiz. I'm from Indian illegally occupied Kashmir. My question to you is whether wishing birthday to someone is permissible in Islam or not. So all these three questions are related to birthdays. The first question is, is it permissible to celebrate birthdays? The second is that can we, if the activities are not Islamic, can we have a birthday party with Islamic activities? And the third is can we wish happy birthday to others? As far as birthday is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there are only two festivals in Islam, two annual festivals. They are the Eidans, the Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. The first is after the Ramzan ends, the Eid al-Fitr, and the second is Eid al-Adha, that's we have the Eid of Sacrifice. These two are the only Eid that are annual Eid is there that is permissible to celebrate. And the Prophet also mentioned that the weekly Eid is on Friday. So the one weekly Eid and two annual Eid. These are the celebration. So any celebration which is celebrated annually every year is again the teaching of Islam except these two. The Eidain, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. That's the Eid al-Nahar, the Eid of Sacrifice. Birthday is more of a Western culture and people celebrate it. It is not an Islamic culture and it is against the teachings of Islam. So therefore, it is not permissible. Any, any celebration which is done on an annual basis, whether it be wedding anniversary, whether it be Valentine's Day, whether it be Mother's Day or whether it be Teacher's Day, all these type of days or annual celebration except for the two Eid are not permissible in Islam. If you have a normal party for graduation, no problem. 
if you have a marriage and you have a party and a celebration for marriage as long as nothing haram is done in that celebration is permitted so celebrating things which are good like marriage or graduation at one time no problem but making it an annual affair you start saying i will have wedding anniversary so this is not permissible in islam this is the main basic ruling there are other reasons why it's not permitted many of the things that is done on birthday it is against the teaching of islam if you go back to the history of the birthday cake how did it originate we come to know it is from the time of the greeks and at that time in the olden days they made cake which was honey cake which was round in shape to resemble a moon for worshiping moon god it was round honey cake resembling a moon and they put candles on it so this was in reverence to the moon god then we have if you read history we come to know that in germany the bakery in 15th century they used to bake cakes it became common then you have in the roman history and so on and so forth today we have they put candles and depending upon how old are you if you are 10 years old they put 10 candles if you are 20 years old they put 20 candles or sometimes they put one additional candle to say that you are going to spend one more year and there are many cultures there are there are many mm, ideologies many superstitions then people they wish and then they blow the candles you know though people talk of being hygienic normally when you blow the candle and you blow on the cake according to research when you blow on the cake the cake has 14 times more germs on it before it was blown so imagine we talk about hygiene but we blow the we blow the candles the candles kept on the cake and there are germs going onto the cake and we serve that cake to everyone we talk about hygiene talk about science but this is all unhygienic there are various other activities associated with birthday which may be haram for example today most of the birthday parties they involve music which is haram they may involve dancing which is haram they may be obscenity which is haram so many activities involved are again the teachings of quran and sunna but the basic thing is celebrating itself is haram second reason is because activities may be haram the question posed is that what if we do not have any haram activities and we have a birthday party and give a islamic lecture is it permissible giving islamic lecture is good you can do it any time of the year on any day of the year but specifically selecting that i was born on this day 19th of september and i will have an islamic lecture because i was born on this day this again is not permissible having islamic lecture any day is permissible but having every year only on that one particular day it is not permissible furthermore many a times birthday celebrations involve celebration of spiritual leaders of messengers like jesus christ peace be upon him this this leads to shirk it may involve celebration of celebrities of famous personalities this leads to hero worship all this is against the teaching of islam regarding the last question that is it permissible to wish someone happy birthday when celebrating birthday itself is not permissible so where is the question of wishing someone happy birthday normally when a person is born on a particular day the life span of every human being is already been determined by last man utala in fact when a birthday comes he is going to live for one year less so is it a point to celebrate or is it a point to mourn so there is no concept it is illogical that you are wishing someone a happy birthday because he has become 20 years old or 30 years old in fact he is going closer to his grave irrespective whether he is going closer to the grave or not celebrating birthday per se is not permitted in islam whether even if it includes activities which are islamic celebrating per se is not permitted and as i mentioned earlier that with most of the birthdays that we have today it is associated associated with shirk with associated with un-islamic activities with music with dance that there is in my advice to the muslim brothers and sisters to the muslim children is that we should stay away from such cultures which are against islam 
against the teaching of the Quran and the Sunnah and we should not celebrate these annual events which is not part of the Islamic culture and Islamic teaching. Hope that answers the question. And the next question, I have a doubt about madhi that the prosthetic fluid is this pure or impure the question posed is that is madhi pure or impure is it najis or is it tahir first let me tell you that there is a difference between money and madhi money is the semen which contains the sperm which is responsible for the birth of the child and madhi is a urethral fluid both are different money is normally it is jelly like and white and grayish in color whereas madhi it is sticky money is normally associated when it is ejected there is a feeling of pleasure followed by a feeling of exhaustion furthermore it smells similar to palm tree pollen and third is it is ejaculated in spurts so there are mainly three ways of identifying uh, money that it is jelly like white and grayish in color number two it has a feeling of pleasure when it's ejaculated and it is followed with a feeling of exhaustion it smells similar to palm tree pollen and fourth it is it it is ejaculated in spurts if any of these things are not these three things are not there then it is considered to be a madhi that is the urethral fluid it doesn't come out in spurts it's not associated with uh, with a uh, with a feeling of pleasure it doesn't have a feeling feeling of exhaustion it doesn't smell like pollen it doesn't smell like palm tree pollen this normally madhi occurs when a person may think about or may make it sexually excited this fluid comes out regarding whether is it pure or impure as far as when a person ejaculates semen money it is called a ceremonial impurity janaba it is compulsory that he should have kusal to get pure if money is ejaculated in the islamic ruling there are various hadith having guzul is compulsory but if madi comes out then only washing that private part is sufficient and doing wudu is sufficient guzul is not a fard so in money when it's ejaculated it is a ceremonial impurity it is janaba having a, whether it is because of a sexual intercourse whether intimate relationship with your husband and wife or whether it be voluntary otherwise if it is ejaculated it is fard that guzul should be done to get pure in madi only washing the private part is sufficient and doing wudu is sufficient regarding money per se is it pure or impure is it najis or tahir in this there are differences of opinion according to the shafi school of thought and one view of imam ahmed ibn hanbal money per se is pure but according to the hanafi school of thought and one view of the of uh, imam ibn ibn hanbal it is impure but after it dries you can scrape it and that is sufficient according to the maliki school of thought it is impure and you should wash it before that thing becomes pure the difference of opinion the reason 
that the Shafi and one school of thought of the humbly school of thought has said it is purely based on a hadith of Hazrat Aisha which occurs in, in say Muslim that the Prophet peace be upon him once when there was money on his garment it dried and he scraped it off the hadith is saying that Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her she said she saw the Prophet when money was there he washed that portion of the garment and he went for prayer that means he didn't wash the full garment he only washed that portion and, and she could see the mark of the washed portion the hadith in saying that there was money on the dress of the Prophet the Prophet took Ud and he applied on it he didn't wash it so based on these various narrations according to the Shafi school of thought and one group of uh, few of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and even according to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah that money per se is pure and what they say that how can there are many people who are pious there are messengers and there are religious people there are sahabas so how can a messenger or a pious person be born out of impurity and that's logical how can a human being be born of impurity when every human being is masum and especially the messengers of Allah and the religious people so I personally also agree with the group of the first scholar that money per se is pure and the hadith is very clear that the prophet did not wash it at times he put wood on it that is sufficient when it dried he scraped it so I do agree with those group of scholars who say that money per se is pure but yet there are some scholars and some fuqahs who say that it is not pure as far as madi is concerned it is there are hadith indicating that madi is najis that is the reason the person himself should wash that part and do wudu but there is a hadith saying that one of the sahabas he told the prophet that he used to do he used to do ghusl very often because he had this problem and madi used to come very often so the prophet said no need of doing ghusl only wash that part and do wudu and he asked what about my clothes he said no need of washing the clothes only take a handful of water and sprinkle on that path where there is madi so if you want to make your garment pure only taking a handful of water and sprinkling on that part is sufficient no need of washing the full garment that is sufficient but madi per se is najis it is impure hope that answers the question <clears throat> the next question from Nabil from Bangladesh isn't it unjust to give one share of property to girls whereas two shares are given to the boys Nabil has asked a question referring to the inheritance and Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 11 and 12 that as for the inheritance of the children the male the son gets double the share of the female that is the daughter if only daughters two or more they get two-third if only one daughter she gets half after paying off all that etc etc and the verse continues then what you leave for your parents your parents get one-sixth if there are children if there are no children mother gets one-third and the next verse, Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 12 says, In what your wife lives for you, you get half the share if there are no children, you get one-fourth the share if there are children. What you leave for your wives, your wife get one-fourth the share if there are no children, she get one-eighth the share if there are children. But I do agree, the question mainly posed is regarding the inheritance for the daughters and sons why do the sons get double and daughters get half daughters get one share son get double share isn't this injustice in islam the main financial burden of taking care 
of the family is on the shoulder of the male. Before a woman is married, it's the duty of the father and the brother to look after her lodging, boarding, clothing and all financial aspects. After she's married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after the boarding, clothing and all financial aspect. So in Islam, so in Islam, as far as the financial aspect is concerned, the burden is laid on the shoulder of the men and not the women. The woman need not work even for a single penny of her expenditure. That is the duty of the man in the family to take care of her. Now, why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained in the glorious Quran that the son gets double the share of the daughters? The reason is that the financial burden is put on the shoulders of the men. For example, if a father dies and after giving the share of the wife and the parents, there is $150,000 that are remaining from his inheritance. And he has got one son and one daughter. So based on the Quranic verse, after giving the share of the mothers and the wife, $150,000 has to be divided between one son and one daughter. So based on the Quran, the son will get $100,000 and the daughter will get $50,000. Now my question to you is that when the son gets $100,000, he has, to spend, he has to spend most of that money on his family to take care. But when the woman gets the $50,000, she doesn't have to spend a single penny on any of the family member. She doesn't have to spend on herself. She can do whatever she wants with that money. So my question to you is that would you prefer inheriting $100,000 and spending almost all of it, maybe $90,000 on taking care of the family? Or would you prefer inheriting $50,000 and not spending a single penny of it on the family. You can even not spend on yourself. Totally you can save it. If you want you can spend on yourself. If you want you can spend on your family. The choice is yours. So but natural any logical person would say he would prefer inheriting $50,000 and keeping everything for himself rather than inheriting $100,000 and spending almost all of it on the family. So in Islam when the shoulder is put on the uh, when the burden is put on the shoulder of the male, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also just. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 40, that Allah is unjust in the least degree. So if he's put the financial burden on the shoulder of the man, so but natural during inheritance, he gives the man in most of the cases double the share. In most, not all, but in most of the cases. For more details, you can refer to my video cassette on women that is in Islam, and there are more details on this topic. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, my name is Muhammad and I am a student. I am from Naukhali, Bangladesh. I know a Hindu girl. She is my well wisher. She is 19 years old. I want to convert her to Islam. So far, I have been able to convince her that she will watch your video lectures. But I don't understand which of your lectures I should give her first. If you could please give me a list of your lectures, I would ask her to watch accordingly. She, she is ignorant about religion. She just follows what her parents taught her from an early age. Brother Muhammad asked a question that he knows of a girl who is 19 years old and, and he convinced her that she will watch my video cassettes. She doesn't have much knowledge about religion, but he wants to convert her to Islam. So which lectures of mine should he give her first? There are several lectures of mine which are available on the YouTube. If you go on the website, you'll have the list of all my lectures. There are more than 100 lectures, video cassettes available. Regarding which lecture should you give first, I would prefer if you first show her my video cassette on the topic similarities between Hinduism and Islam. So whatever little knowledge she has about Hinduism, if you give this lecture of mine, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, that will be beneficial for her. The next lecture you can give is my debate with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar on the topic concept of God in Islam and Hinduism based on the religious scriptures. 
this debate itself is also very interesting and will be beneficial for her. After showing the lectures on Hinduism and Islam, you can show her my video cassette on misconceptions about Islam. This deals with the reply to the common question asked by non-Muslims. And the lecture given in Dubai is very good. And even the question answer session after the talk is very good. So you can surely very well ask her to see my lecture on misconception about Islam, part one and part two, the two lectures, part one, part two. Part one contains the first half of the question asked by the non-Muslim regarding Islam and part two contains the second half. After this, yet if she wants to see more, more videos of mine, she can very well watch my video cassette on women's rights in Islam. And she will come to know what are the wonderful rights that a woman has in Islam, which is not there in other religions. You can ask her to see my lecture on Quran and modern science, compatible and compatible, which is also very interesting. You can also ask her to see my lecture on is the Quran God's word. So these are the few about six, seven cassettes, she being Hindu is important for her to see regarding misconceptions, Hinduism and Islam, misconception about science and women's rights. These will be beneficial for her, inshallah, if Allah wills, Allah will give her hidayah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give hidayah to this Hindu girl so that she accepts Islam. There's a question posed by Abu Hasnat Salim. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I am from India. Can I marry a girl who's from a different madhab? School of thought. The brother. The question posed by the brother is Can he marry a Muslim girl from a different madhab? We know that, alhamdulillah, there are four very famous madhab, that is the Hanafi school of thought, the Shafi, the Maliki, and the Hanbali. And all these, alhamdulillah, according to Ali Sunnah wal Jamaat, all of these, mashallah, belong to the broader group of Ali Sunnah wal Jamaat, and all of them, mashallah, they are correct, as long as we should see that they are not following anything which is deviation from Quran and Sunnah. All these four Aymas, they were great scholars. MashaAllah, they came to guide the Muslim Ummah regarding the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. There is no problem in marrying from any of these four madhab, but see to it that individually that person is Islamic, following the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, marrying from any of these four madhab is no problem. But see to it that the practice, she should be a virtuous girl. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that when you marry, you look for four things. One is beauty, second is wealth, third is nobility, and the fourth is virtue, that is deen. And the most important is deen. So more important is that how much close she is to the deen, how virtuous she is, how virtuous is she, this is the most important. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give you a good life partner. The next question, Assalamu alaikum sir, my name is Fahim Ahmad bin Jawed. I am from Bangladesh. I am a big fan of yours. I love you for the sake of Allah. I love you too. I want to meet you at least once and hug you. 
I am a young man. How can I make the most of my youth in the worship of Allah? What can I do because the worship of youth is more dear to Allah and I want to be a dai like you but my family is poor. I have to work for them. How can I do two things together? Question was by Brother Fahim that is from Bangladesh and he's a fan of mine. He wants to meet me. Inshallah if Allah wills, we'll do meet. He wants to hug me if Allah wills. And he has asked the question that in his youth he wants to do dawa and he wants to become a dai like me but he also has to work because his family is poor. How can he do both together? The best solution and I do agree with you brother that Allah will ask that how did you spend your youth? And the more Islamic activities you do when you're young, it is better for you, for your akhirah, as well as for the dunya. So the decision you have taken is to become a dai when you're young is a very good decision. May Allah fulfill it and may Allah make it easy. Regarding a main question, that since your family is poor, you have to earn a living, how can you do both together? My advice to you would be that if there is any Islamic organization or a dawah organization in Bangladesh where you're living, my advice to you would be join that organization, you can do dawa and also get earning, be an employee of that organization and inshallah you'll be able to do both together. If you do not have dawa organizations in the place where you're living or you feel that they cannot afford to pay salary, the next best option would be you can do a job in which it, is, it has more holidays. Like if you go to a corporate company or many of the businesses, they have two holidays in a week, Saturday and Sunday, or maybe Thursday and Friday. So then you have more free time. Join an organization which has less working hours so that you have less burden. And in this way, if you join an organization which has less working hours and five days a week, then at least you can spend a great deal of your time in doing dawa on holidays and at other times. If you have the passion for dawa, alhamdulillah, so you get the best of both, you are working in an organization, you are getting your income, at the same time in your free time you are doing dawa. this is another option that can, that can be adopted. But don't wait, you should start doing dawa immediately. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Balligo anivala aya, propagate even if you know one verse. As long as you know that verse correctly, it's your duty to propagate it, don't wait, you can do dawa through internet, through social media, it's very easy. For more details, you can go to my website, zakirnaik.com, which has a separate section, International Dawa Training Program, in which you'll get many tips on how to do dawa and how to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the other people. The next question, Adil Rashid from Kashmir. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum salam. What comes first, religion or country? Non-Muslims always ask this question, especially Hindus. But the Adil Rashid has said that how to reply to a question when non-Muslim poses, especially Hindu, that what comes first, religion or country? And several years ago, this question was posed to me by a Hindu after my public lecture. And he asked me, the Dr. Zakir, according to you, which is first, religion or country? I got up and I said and asked him that according to you, can you tell me who comes first? Are you first the son of your father or are you first the son of your mother? And the questioner smiled and he got the reply. This is a witty reply. Mainly, mainly when people try and trap you, that which comes first, your religion or your country, and then you're trapped. Will you lay allegiance to your religion or will you lay allegiance to your country? And whichever answer you give, you'll get trapped. So I asked him a counter question. Do you, are you the son first of your father or son of your mother? This is how to reply when someone tries to trap you. But let's come to the basic question, which is, which comes first? Is it religion or is it your country? 
Let me give you an analogy or an example that if you're working in a company and you're an assistant manager, your immediate boss is your manager. Then your boss's boss is the general manager. And finally on top is the owner of your company. I'm asking a simple question that if the instruction of your manager contradicts with the instruction of the general manager or contradicts with the instruction of the boss of the company, who will you follow? But naturally the best would be that you follow the instruction of both your manager, general manager as well as your boss of the company. But if it contradicts, who will you follow? The manager, the general manager or the owner of the company? And the correct answer is the owner of the company. The owner of the company, he is your boss's boss's boss. He's the owner. He may not have time to interact with everyone, so he gives the instruction. The general manager, general manager gives to the manager, manager gives to you. Suppose the main owner of the company says you should not cheat. But your immediate boss, manager says no problem, cheat. You know, take bribing. Who will you follow? But natural, who will the head? Similarly, what you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is the creator of all the human beings. And He is the sustainer and cherisher. Best is, where it comes to country and religion, best is to follow both. But if there is a conflict between the teachings or the instruction or the rules and regulation of the country and of your religion, if it contradicts with the saying of Allah and His Rasul, but natural, there is no question for a Muslim, Allah and Rasul is one, first, number one. Following the commandments of Allah and the Messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is much more important than following the rules and regulation of the country. Best is to follow both. But if they contradict, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is not only the creator of you, but creator, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only your creator, he is the creator of your country, he is the creator of your continent, he is the creator of the full world. He is the ultimate boss. No one is above him. So maybe the constitution of your country or maybe the prime minister of your country may say something. But Allah is the creator of the prime minister and the president of your country also. So if the instruction contradict, best is to follow both. If the instruction contradict, then as a Muslim, the commandment of Allah and His Rasul take precedence over the rule and regulation and law of the country. And Alhamdulillah, as far as India is concerned, India is one of the few countries in the world where it is permitted for every citizen of India to preach, practice and follow his religion. And I don't know of any rule in the constitution of India which, which makes it compulsory for a Muslim who is living in India to do something which is haram. There is no rule or no regulation in the constitution of India which forces a Muslim to do something haram. Like nowhere does it say that you should have alcohol, nowhere does it say that you should do shirk, no. And neither is there any rule or regulation in the country which Islam says it is fard and the country says don't do it. Islam says pray five times anyway. Nowhere, nowhere does the rule of the country say that, you, say that you cannot pray. Islam says you should fast. Nowhere does the rule of Indian constitution say that you cannot fast. So there is no rule in the Indian constitution which forces you to do something which is haram and there is no rule in the Indian constitution which prevents you to do something which is fard. There may be other things which are mobile etc which may be problematic. So as far as the Indian constitution is concerned, it doesn't contradict with Islamic teachings. It makes it difficult for you to live. In fact, the Indian constitution has a separate Islamic personal law, a Muslim personal law, where it gives it to follow the rules and regulation. As far as the person thing is concerned regarding marriage, regarding divorce, regarding inheritance, it gives you permission. So where there is a conflict 
between Allah and His Rasul and the country, but not Allah and His Rasul, your deen takes precedence over your country. Hope that answers the question. And the next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Mumta Zahan. I am from London. I heard from you about Salatul Duha. Please could you explain how many rakats to be offered and which is the best time to pray Salatul Duha? Thank you so much, Dr. Zakir. May Allah bless all of us. The question posed is that how many rakat should be prayed in Salatul Duha and which is the best time to offer Salatul Duha? As far as Salatul Duha is concerned, Salatul Duha is prayed any time after the sun reaches a certain height after sunrise and can be prayed just before the time of Dohar, just before the sun reaches its highest point. And when Ibn Uthaymi, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, when uh, Sheikh Muhammad Salib ibn, uh, when Muhammad Salib ibn Uthaymi, when he was asked, may Allah have mercy on him, that what time can you pray Duha? So he said, you can pray Salatul Duha 15 minutes after sunrise up to 10 minutes before the Duhar time. Before the sun reaches its peak, 10 minutes before that. This is the time of Duha. And when we offer Salatul Duha at the early time, immediately after sunrise, it is also called as Ishraq. Ishraq Salah coming from Sharak, coming from the word sunrise, sunrise. So immediately after sunrise, you offer a Salah, it's called Ishraq, but it is Salatul Duha. If it's prayed in the early part, it's called as Ishraq. Which is the best time to pray? The best time to pray Salat al-Duha is when the heat of the sun is at its maximum. It is the midpoint between sunrise and sun reaching its highest point or between sunrise and Zohar time. This time the midpoint is the best time or a little bit after that this is the best time to pray Salat al-Duha but can we pray any time as I mentioned 15 minutes after sunrise to 10 minutes before sun reaching the highest point. Regarding how many rakat to pray, there are various hadith. The minimum you can pray is two rakat. The hadith of Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, my best friend, referring to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that you should do three things in life always. Fast three days in a month. Pray two rakat salatu duha and pray with her before going to sleep. So in this hadith you come to know that the Prophet recommended Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, to pray two rakah salatu duha. When Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was asked that how many rakah did the Prophet pray during salatu duha? So she said the Prophet prayed four rakat and anything above that. But most of the time the Prophet prayed salatu duha, four rakat, two plus two. But there is a hadith also saying that before Fatih Makkah, the Prophet prayed eight rakat salat duha. So the minimum a person can offer salat duha is two rakat. Maximum, there is no particular limit mentioned. But Prophet most of the time prayed four rakat. There are occasions saying that he also prayed eight rakat. There is no limit per se prescribed. But minimum is two rakat and Prophet prayed four rakat. So I normally pray four rakat and I try and pray at midpoint or after the midpoint between sunrise and sun reaching its highest point. I hope that answers the question. This will be the last question. 
before we end the session. Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum salam. I am Muhammad Ahnaf Taki from Dhaka, Bangladesh, and I am a student. When I start my prayer, I think Allah is in front of me and I'm worshiping Him. Alhamdulillah. As I don't know how the Almighty Allah looks like, so He appears in my mind as a humanoid structure. When I asked my religious teacher about this, he told me to think about His bounties and gracefulness to us. But when I started to think about His creations in Salah, it seems to me that I am worshipping the creations of Allah, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now my question is, will this be treated as shirk? And how can I get rid of this problem? Please answer my question, I'm totally at a loss. Brother Muhammad Anaf Taki has asked a very important question, that when he reads the Salah, he does not know how Allah looks, so he starts thinking of a humanoid structure. When he asked the religious teacher, said that you think about the creation of Allah, and that's better, so he started thinking of creation of Allah, and then he's asking that, isn't he, doesn't it feel that I'm worshipping the creation rather than the creator? As far as Salah is concerned, it's common that a person's mind does divert offering Salah, does divert while offering Salah. To prevent your mind from diverting and to increase your khushu, to increase your concentration on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best would be that you should, besides reciting, the Arabic portion, what you are supposed to recite, Surah so Fatiha and, and any other Surah, you should also recollect the meaning of what you are reciting. Because we are so much used to reciting Surah Fatiha, we know it by heart, we know by heart. If you wake up someone from the middle of his sleep, you can recite Surah Fatiha at 100 miles per hour because we have been doing it for years together. So because it has become mechanical, a very small portion of your mind is utilized and there are chances the mind will divert. When you start thinking about Allah, I don't know what to think. So the best is, besides reciting the Arabic portion of the Quran or the other aspects, you should recollect the meaning of it. So if you are reciting, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, most gracious, most merciful, Malik Yamuddin, the master of the day of judgment, Iyak and Abdu Iyak and Ustain, the alone we worship, the alone we ask for help. Same time when you are reciting Surah Fatiha, at the back of your mind, recollect the meaning. Now when you start recollecting the meaning, even that becomes mechanical. So to prevent your mind from diverting and increasing your concentration on Salah, the best is that besides recollecting the meaning, also concentrate on the meaning. You cannot concentrate 100% on two things together. You can concentrate 50-50% on two things, but not 100%, percent not possible. So that's the reason to increase your concentration. The best would be you recollect the meaning and you concentrate on the meaning. Once you start concentrating on the meaning, inshallah, your mind will not divert. And once you start concentrating on the meaning, you don't have to look for an image. I've been praying. I don't have an image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I concentrate on the meaning. And once you concentrate on the meaning, there's no... If your mind is empty, I do agree with you. It will require to have some image something, but if your mind is occupied recollecting the meaning and considering the meaning, inshallah, inshallah, that is the best. You will increase your khushu and you will also increase your concentration Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your salah would be much better. We have run out of time and inshallah we will meet next time on the same day next week inshallah on Saturday but we will start the program about 35 minutes earlier because the Maghrib is coming closer and closer in Riyadh inshallah next time we'll have the program after the Maghrib Salah so it would be 11.30 in Malaysia inshallah it will be 6.30 in Saudi Arabia Makkah time would be 6.30 and the GMT time would be 3.30 it will be 35 minutes earlier than what we had now. So inshallah next time we'll have the program as Dr. Zakir Naik and his son Farik, season 3 and session 4. Till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhiru dawan alhamdulillah alameen.